We don't have this jingle, right? The no. awesome <laughs> jingle. Okay, yeah. today without any jingle. Okay, but we are live. And uh, hello, everybody. So nice to see you all for recess of an hour. We are back after a summer break. This is episode 24. So episode 24 of recess of an hour. Maybe first we can introduce ourselves. Oh, I should maybe also say what Resource Software Hour is about for those who are new to it. So this is our stream every two weeks where we will talk about everything Resource Software. So from terminal editors to work with version control, reproducibility, programming languages, working with other people, managing research groups, managing software engineering groups, um, and uh, we, so this is live, we also record, um, we welcome questions. You can ask questions on HackMD, the link is in the Twitch chat. Mm -hmm. And quick introduction around, so my name is Radovan Bast and I'm, I'm calling in from University of Tromsø, Northern Norway, our first time from office in the whole research software our series. And I'm so happy that Today with us is Shashank from University of Leeds. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Shashank. Uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in physics at the University of Leeds. And I'm also a research software engineering enthusiast. And we have met at one of the resource software engineer conferences and now collaborated on a couple of things. And it's so nice to have you here. And Richard from Alto slash Helsinki. Yeah, I'm Richard Darst. I work at Alto University in Helsinki. I work in the scientific computing group there, supporting, well, basically anything related to computing and research. And before we go into today's topic, we can maybe share, can we screen share the website? Could I do that? Do you want to? Yeah, I can share it quickly. Yep. Because I wanted to show that we have a couple of upcoming shows planned. Also, the time is new, is different. So we are trying now different um, formats. So instead of streaming in the Central European evening, we now try two o'clock mm -hmm. or Wednesday afternoon, um, Central European time. So one o'clock UK, three o'clock Finland. Yeah. And the plan is to do, we will try every two weeks. Yeah and maybe try to make it a bit more like a seminar series or something like that, but still very hands-on. I mean, we don't know. We're we're just trying this out to see what comes up. Yeah, I guess so we'll comments, see. welcome. So two weeks from now, we'll talk about how to organize software and data in a new research group. Two weeks later, uh, we will talk about GitHub, introduction to GitHub, best practices when using GitHub. And then two weeks even later, lessons learned from starting a resource of engineering group at the university. So this can be very interesting for the emerging resource of engineering groups. Yeah. And today we have a super topic. So what, what are we going to talk about today? Yeah. So actually we took a really long time to figure out what the name of the topic would be, even though I think we all had this idea. So in the end, Shashen came up with this good idea, Computers for Research 101, the essential course everyone skipped. So this is not like how a processor works, how memory works and stuff like that. And it's also not how you do programming and stuff like that, like how you would do day-to-day -day tasks, but sort of like this middle layer of what goes on inside the computer with all the files and programs and things like that, that you sort of need to know in order to be really productive, but you're often not really taught. I mean, it could be something as simple as how you organize files to not make a huge amount of chaos. I mean, this is something that, like, you know, whenever I started, you know, you organize stuff and it sort of works, but um, by the end of your degree, you might not be able to find anything. So, any thoughts on that from anyone else? <laughs> uh, I think we learn a lot from experience as mm -hmm. time goes on. So, yeah. Uh, day one of when you start working with a project, uh, and if you have no, no computational background previously, uh, you start organizing your files like you would 
regularly uh, maybe you know when you're doing your normal stuff and you soon realize that organizing files and scripts and everything for a research project is completely different and uh, uh, you then everyone i think comes up with a strategy of their own how to organize files and how how it would suit best uh, with the project but the general outline remains kind of same mm -hmm. and this is where we can learn from each other yeah so as we're talking you can communicate back with us. So first off, there's the Twitch chat, but you have to log in to see that. Second, there's this HackMD, which I will send a link in the Twitch chat. And I will try to screen share that now. Okay, one, oh, there we go. Well, this is not exactly it, but it will work. Mm, yeah, so here we have this. It's HackMD, so it's like a shared document drive. Um, if you go to the edit mode, you can write things here. So you can say, oh, someone's giving an example. So ask questions and then answer. And we're constantly looking at this. So anytime we say something, if you have a comment, just write down right down there and you will and we'll see what you say and comment on it. So with that being said, should we continue? Go on. Uh, okay. So I so, think Yeah. I think I will feel the first version and this comes mm -hmm. from something that Richard suggested once that computers are not as smart. <laughs> Whereas, uh, if you talk about computers, most of us have a smartphone in our pockets. Mm. So, what do you mean by saying that uh, my smartphone or my computer is not smart? <laughs> well, yeah. So, maybe it goes, it's like they say, computers do what they're told and exactly what they're told. So, if you don't ask the right questions, you won't get the right answer out. So, it can extend your abilities, but it doesn't do something which is completely new that you haven't told it somehow. Does anyone else have this kind of feeling? Yeah, there was this, I don't know from whom is this quote, that computers are like a genie. Uh, so it, it does precisely what you asked it for, but it may not be what you really wanted. <laughs> okay, I like that, yeah. So what's the first part of computers to talk about? Well. I sort of started with the example of data and files. So what's a file anyway? Does anyone have a comment there? You know, uh, an icon on the screen? Yeah. Something inside the folder? <laughs> you know, and actually, so I, um, Let's see, it was sort of recently I was reading this memoir about how they created the Unix operating system. And I learned something really interesting in there. So um, apparently when they first made computers, so the type of file was a property of the operating system. Like there would be a text file and it could only be opened in text editors. Or there might be a executable file like a program and it could only be run and um, and so on, things like that. And this was like sort of a problem because things weren't that flexible. Like if you wanted to make a new file type, like let's say a spreadsheet, you had to have a new file type in the operating system. And that's the first lesson here. So on a modern computer, all files are the same. So there's really no difference between what you might open in a word processor and what you can open in a text file. And this turns out to be quite important for flexibility somehow. Yeah, I think I read the same book and I also found that very striking. And, and maybe completing that, I, well, files are not all the same maybe, but at least it's complete. It's up to the program. It's not up to the operating system. Mm -hmm. So it's up to up to the program or up to people, up to us to we, we can put into files whatever we like. 
we don't have to ask the operating system whether this is good or not. And this gives a lot of flexibility. Yeah. And I also didn't know that this was not always like that. Yeah. So what kind of flexibility do we get when any program can open any files? Do you have any examples of when you've done something like this? Uh I have I have a question before that. Yeah. How can you how can you really open any file in any program? Oh. So for example, if I open an image file, uh, it would show me in an image editor, or maybe I can drag it into a into a word processor. But yeah. what what do you, what do you really mean when you say that I can open any file in any program? Hmm. How does that work? Yeah. So. You're right, like if you open an image file in a text editor, it looks like a bunch of random data. Uh, can someone have an example we can show of that? But um, yeah, so not everything that you can open will be useful in something else. But what very often happens in on like my computers, there's some file and I don't know what's in it. I'll try opening in a text editor and see. Or, you know, there's a file that's made for uh, some program. And by looking inside of the file, I get some hints about how it's being used. And, um, yeah. Sometimes you can even open things and try to modify it with the text editor. So something like an image, that's probably not going to work too well. but for some other things you can. And this is really useful to understand sort of what's going on under the hood here. So I have an example if you want to see. Yeah, sure. Try to guess what is this. Are you okay, here we go. Right off on the screen. So yeah. So what I did is I opened, though, um, actually, this is a video file, and I opened it accidentally or not accidentally in a text editor. Mm -hmm. So a video program would understand this, but yeah. the text editor assumes that, well, this is just a bunch of characters. Do we see any hints about what it is at the top? Maybe here. Videoland.org slash x264. Yeah. So here and we see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here we see some metadata inside of the file. So if we what's, didn't know, what's that? Metadata. Uh, <laughs> so okay. So if this is a video <laughs> file, the data is well the video stream, like what's actually there. But metadata says things like how it's been encoded. So here on the second line, I can see something that says options, C A B A C equals one, ref equals three, D block equals. So I don't really know what this means offhand, but. This is somehow, it tells you how the file was made. So if you, um, like this is really useful, like you don't want to have a bunch of data lying around without metadata, because then it's not useful. I mean, I guess you could say every file has metadata, but if the metadata only exists in your head, you're going to forget it, and then the file will be useless. So, yeah. So as the name suggests, metadata is data about my data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's the way they normally put it. Yeah. So this is interesting that the text file, uh, to me, it seems like, uh, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. But uh, some program, maybe a video editor or a video uh, player can understand it. Yeah. Uh, how, how does the operating system know that it, uh, this file has to be sent to, uh, to a video editor or whatever to be handled? So mm. what what bridges uh, what bridges the file fo file you know how it has been formatted or the file format and uh, what application is being used to run it or visualize it? That's a good question. So in many modern modern operating systems, it's this extension idea. So you basically have um, like the dot mp4 or .jpg and so on. So this is a property of the operating system. So it knows if it ends in .jpg, when I try to open it, like double click on it, it will by default try to open it in some image editor. 
but you aren't necessarily limited to what the operating system has. So in fact, well, actually I sort of just made this up, but the more different programs that can open a single file, the more useful that file is. Would you agree with that? I agree. I mean, example, CSV file, comma-separated comma values. So yeah. that's something I can read in the plot, but I can also read it into a spreadsheet, mm -hmm. a text file. Yeah, without... yeah. That's a good point. So let's say you're doing some research project, and you have some data, and you put it in a spreadsheet. Then it's sort of difficult for you to open that in another program. But whenever you write it into a CSV file, then you can open that in an editor and see what's there. And it's really easy for you to open it in a program that you write yourself and then um, read in the data and write it out. But opening an Excel file in your own program, well, I mean, you can do it with some other library, but then you're doing a lot more work. So CSV file is a text file, uh, uh, essentially. Uh, why, why, why won't you store everything as text in some format or other? Hmm. Why not always use text uh, in a, you know, yeah. always format in a special manner so it can represent every imaginable thing? Yeah. Uh, why not everything's text file that you can also read uh, but with as a, as a human being and then the computer can understand as well? Yeah. That's a good question. I mean, there's many people that do like to do that. Like they'll say, okay, I want everything to be in a text format because that means it's sort of intrinsically understandable by a human and thus I can read it later. You know, this sort of goes to archival formats. Like if you want something to be open, openable in a hundred years, saving it as a Microsoft Word file is maybe not a good idea because that program can go away. Saving it as a text file is a good idea. And sort of in the middle is something like a PDF. So it's an open standard. So it's not just Adobe Acrobat that can read it, but there's many other programs that can. So likely we won't forget the, that knowledge in the next hundred years. But I mean, independently of that, like, why do we still, so why do we, so, so maybe a re related question or the same question is, so why are there binary formats? Mm -hmm. Why are there formatting uh, formats? Or why do we use binary formats if they are maybe a little bit inconvenient for uh, humans? I guess they can be faster to read and sometimes they can take less space, like if they're compressed. So, yeah. And I guess maybe that's like a big difference. So when you're using some consumer software, it's for the mass market. Most people will just be using the program to use it. So binary formats make sense. But whenever you're doing a project yourself, sharing with other people you work with, other students, it's better if it's easier to understand. And the binary format can even be a problem even if you share it not with anybody else, but just with yourself, mm -hmm. or not with a different computer. Mm -hmm. Because on a different computer, it can be then there can be slight differences. Yeah. What uh, what kind of differences? For example, uh, like I have had issues with even text files having different formats mm. on different operating systems. <laughs> uh, so how 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 does that work, and are there ways to get around it? What are you referring to? Radovan, do you want to answer that? I think I can, but maybe you've dealt with that a bit more than me. <laughs> so now we're talking about, so I agree that it can be difficult also text files across different computers, but now we are talking about binary files or the text files? Yeah, uh, binary files first, and then maybe we can also talk about text files, because both of them we encounter as uh, RSCs. Mm -hmm. So binary files can be a problem, if out of a programming language like Fortran, if I save save the data in binary format, it it will be saved in a certain order. 
the order may not be the same on different machines. Also, the like number of bits, there is also this NDN. So mm -hmm. order and how many. Uh, so what do you say? OK, like oftentimes when people make a binary format, it's sort of tied to the computer itself, like the, the data types in the processor. It can be. So yeah, if it's tied like that, then that means it might be diffic difficult to open in another processor without doing yes. extra work in opening it. Yeah. Yes. And commenting about the text files, so, uh, one very popular or unpopular issue is uh, line endings. Mm -hmm. uh, when, especially when moving between Unix and Windows. Yeah. Uh, and then a tool which I want to mention, and I would, I would put it on HackMD, is DOS to Unix, which I often use to convert one into the other. <laughs> so to remove certain online endings and add others, I will put it on HackMD. Yeah. Should we go on? Um, what about file size? In a major project, is there an ideal size for a file or number of files? What happens if you have a hundred million files? Uh, so I, I think I'll give a bit of background. Yeah. So th I have had a case uh, where someone else uh, was having uh, a lot of small files, mm -hmm. and then they figured out they have to transfer it <laughs> from one computer to another. And uh, uh, zipping it and transferring it would have been uh, uh, like in that scenario, zipping it, zipping it and transferring it was mm -hmm. the best case. But uh, the data that they had was essentially could have been in a single big file as well mm -hmm. and would have saved them a lot of trouble. Uh, so uh, like this is where the question comes from. What, what, what do you think is an ideal file size? Uh, sometimes it can be too big to hold in the memory and yeah. that can be a barrier. But sometimes when you're transferring, no, Imagine having a million files and initiating mm. a transfer for each of them. Yeah. So what, like, with the experience you have, uh, both of you, uh, what's the what's what would you say is the nice balance between having a large number of files mm. and, you know? Wow, that's a really philosophical question. So, <laughs> I guess mainly, well, what do you say as big as possible? I mean, I would say as big as practical for your purpose, the better. You mean as few as few files as possible for transferring? The... Right, yeah. Yes. Like... But it may not be possible because I may not actually have the space to generate that big archive. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like what if my disk is full with lots of small files? Yeah. I, don't, I may not be able to actually combine mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. So I mean, what I have done uh, is to come with an external hard drive and archive it onto the hard drive and then copy it over. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If the file is too big to be copied, it can be chunked. Yeah. So if we can chunk files, copy them over, recombine them. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There is one can, yeah, I don't know if you have other ideas on how to. So yeah. sending many small files is definitely a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that having many small files is also a problem yeah. on supercomputers. Yes. There like, are typically limits. Yeah, on like our sets. There's definitely. Maybe we can so, talk. Oh, go ahead. Uh, uh, so this is basically, um, as an end user, generally you won't know in the sense, why is there a limit on number of files you would have mm. on a computer? Can you so, talk us through it? Yeah. So it's basically for the management point of view. So we can give you a live example. So at my university, we're migrating to a new storage system for our cluster. And when you're accessing a file to do anything, so in our case, copying, but you know, even for your own work, there's two times that matter. There's the latency time to open the file, and then there's the time to actually read the file. And in general, reading files is very fast but there's a fixed overhead for opening every file. So when we have to transfer, say, 2 billion files, even if the latency is 10 milliseconds, well, you can just compute how long it would take to transfer everything. And in short, it just sort of doesn't work. 
So we need to keep the number of files limited to people in order to manage things. Like even running a find command on someone's directory that takes a million files, that has a million files, it would take a long time and put a big load on the system. And this is just not a good thing. Is, is there a limit on number of files you can create imposed by the uh, by the system and how mm. how are these files stored um, like because mm. uh, I have uh, yeah they, they are things like you know uh, file systems yeah. uh, uh, for sure Windows uses something uh, other than what Unix systems tends mm -hmm. to use so uh, what 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 do you want to yeah. Uh, talk. Uh, we'd like to talk about that and yeah. how, how does that come into this equation of number of files and so <laughs> forth. That's a good point. So you mentioned this word file system, which we'll hear often. So a file system is basically the arrangement of files into another file and that other file being the raw hard disk. Like especially in Unix and Linux, but probably other operating systems, you can actually open your hard disk as a file and see the raw data there. And that data is the file system. And this file system, there's different uh, types of them. Uh, for example, there's NTFS, which is used on Windows or EXT234 that's used on Linux a lot. There's the FAT file system and so on. And these have different properties, like the file system might have a maximum limit on number of files or longest file name or largest size and so on. Usually we don't hit these limits like for a person by themselves, but it might be hit on something like a cluster or something where you have petabytes of storage. But uh, I mean, adding to this, so about the question, of, so why is there a limitation on the number of files? Why? And this this is, I mean, one way to look at it is that somewhere we need like a lookup table. Mm -hmm. Where on this big hard drive with lots lots of ones and zeros, where do I find this file? file? So there's a lookup table that tells me where to find it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that lookup table has well, often always, I don't know actually whether it's always, yeah. a limited number of spaces. Mm -hmm. And I think they make some file systems that might have fewer limits, but also when you have fewer limits, that means there's more risk of something going wrong. So the most reliable ones tend to have these limits somehow. What do you so, think? Uh, oh. uh, are these things limited to computers? Uh, so for example, uh, each of us carry a small computer with us as mm -hmm. called the smartphone. Yeah. Um, how, how are things organized over there? Because uh, I have I've experienced this that as time is progressing, uh, I can, uh, there was a time I can access all the files on my computer, uh, on mm -hmm. my phone. And now I can not mm. uh, because I, yeah, there's, there, there are softwares to access any si single kind of file, but not all of them. Uh, how, how how do phones handle uh, these files? Are they different or what's different when you talk to phones yeah. versus computer? Hmm. I mean, I think under the hood, like you said, the phone really is a computer. And at least Android runs Linux under the hood. iOS, I'm not sure exactly, but um, is it based on another form of Unix? But yeah, I mean, it has the file system on there. And like you can actually, sometimes you can connect to your phones and see the raw file system as the Linux system itself. And um, yeah, I mean, all these same things apply to the phone, except that the phone has sometimes more metadata. Like the phone might try to separate files by application. So that way, like this is for security. You can't install some app that will access data from another app. And also they try to make it more user-friendly by hiding everything that happens under the hood. I mean, more user-friendly to some. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I think there are two things to play. One is permissions, very good points to separate things into silos. But the other thing is 
um, I mean, not ma making it extremely convenient to browse all the files, so yeah. to hide it a bit. Yeah. Because then, then the app can decide where to store it, and it can go into the cloud, and it's a bit, too, it's a bit moved out of our side. But I think conceptually, it's, it's done in a in a very similar way. Yeah. Uh, so, so how, what are permissions in the, in the sense, uh, like rather one mentioned permissions mm. and sort of you, Richard, what are they and do, do do you have them on a normal computer? Why don't we encounter, uh, yeah. why don't we encounter them on a daily basis or do we? This is actually a really good point and something that you don't think about when it's just your computer. But once you get to the cluster, it really matters. I mean, on our cluster, there's thousands of users that are using it for their work. And we clearly cannot have people accessing other people's files. So for that, all computers have the concept of users. So um, mm, yeah, so on the cluster, everyone has a username and user ID. And every time there's a file stored or a process run, it's tied to a user ID. And there's a way that it's defined where uh, you, you have permission. So basically, my files are recorded for my user and no one else can access them unless I, um, unless I give that permission to someone else. But some of us have experienced it also on a single user system. If, like if you have a laptop that is, for instance, managed by the university. Mm -hmm. or by the employer mm -hmm. and you may not have permissions to actually install new yeah. programs or apps or so then then there is already a concept of permissions yeah somebody being you know, have more, more having more permissions than others yeah so when talking about permissions uh, one thing you hear quite often especially with the employer systems is admin mm -hmm. so now uh, like what, what are the permissions that an admin would generally have? And uh, if I have a file system, say I'm using Linux, uh, can you show us how can I figure out who, who, who has permissions regarding a file or how do I figure out if I can access a file or not and who might have permissions yeah. if I want to access the file? Would someone like to share a screen and show from Linux how to look at file permissions and ownership and stuff like that? I can just a second to step up here. Okay. Yeah, I can show something. So, um, and we've talked about files a lot. Maybe after this, would you like to talk about organizing files? Okay. Now we see your screen. Maybe it's tiny. I actually don't know how to. S I don't know how to able to zoom in somehow. It's perhaps good enough. Yeah. Um, so what here, I see a bunch of files. This is actually, I see two files and two folders. Yeah. And all of this is inside some other folder. I see ownership. So in this case, the ownership is this person here, which is my username. Um, sometimes we see also, a, there is a user and a group. I don't see it here in this case. Mm -hmm. And I see this information here to the left, which which tells me who is able to read R, who is able to write, who is able to execute uh, these files, or who is able to modify the folders. Right. Okay. So this, these permissions, they would then be part of the meta information of, of a file. Yeah. And you found this with ls-la to list everything, which yes. is a useful command to know. OK, so how do we organize files? Like, how do you keep from getting all these files, um, keep them from becoming a big mess? Yeah, it's good that I stopped screen sharing because my my hard drive is not very well organized. But uh, we keep we keep them organized by often by putting them into other folders mm -hmm. and moving folders into other folders. So often in a hierarchical way, but it's not the only way. Yeah. 
So once, actually it was recently, I wanted to find a file I had made around the year 2008. And as far as I know, I should have had it, should have, that I should still have that file in some archive or some directory somewhere. But I still haven't been able to find it. So how do you organize things so you can find it later? You mean like a descriptive file name? Yeah. Well, I can say the thing that I've, my current hypothesis on this matter. So first off, every project should have a name that describes it somehow. And then you organize things by these names, but you try to not organize projects inside of each other. So I think my problem was that I had a project for a certain topic and I said, okay, now I'm gonna do something else on this topic, which is related. So I put it inside of that directory and then that's where my file is. But since it's in multiple levels, I have multiple places I would need to look for those and I just can't like, I can't find those multiple levels, but when everything is at only one level of organization, then at least I know what I would have called this project, so I just have to look for that. Does that resonate with anyone? Yes, and adding additional tip, like if you know what was inside the file, sometimes I search for files by the content. Mm. So I grab through everything yeah. uh, and look for whether I find it, find it inside if I didn't choose a very good name for the file yeah. or if I don't remember it. Yeah, I tend to do a bit chronologically in the sense that I, uh, uh, if there's a project, I would do it, uh, but also keep it in a particular year. Because um, that's how my mind tends to work in the sense that I can I remember when I did something, and this this uh, when I have to relook, you know, uh, re find data uh, that it was done in the past, uh, mm -hmm. I can always recall around which time I did something, and that's mm -hmm. that's how I point to my data and search have a subfolder to search through. That's a good point. Yeah. What happens when projects are running for a very long time? Uh, uh, then uh, so far that has generally happened uh, when I'm associated with certain kind of employment. So for mm -hmm. example, uh, all the work that I did for my PhD goes into one single thing because mm -hmm. that was a four year period. Yeah. And then I can somehow remember, okay, this is definitely related to the work that I did for my uh, thesis and mm -hmm. get and find it over there. Yeah. So speaking of timestamp, we are now a little bit over half mark of the show. Should we move on to like computing or some other topics? Should we talk yeah. more about storage and organization? What about, yeah, I think we should move on. What about, so when you're computing things, let's say you're scaling up from a single something on your laptop to something that runs on a cluster or you need to run multiple things at once. You want to run something in parallel. What are the considerations here? And what can go wrong? Anyone have thoughts there? What are the ways of doing this? <laughs> One thing that definitely goes wrong is the assumption that uh, with increasing computing power, uh, uh, available computing power comes increased uh, uh, reserves or whatever. Mm -hmm. So for example, using two computers is not as efficient as using a single computer for uh, twice the duration. So the scaling does not work uh, in that fashion. Mm -hmm. If you yeah. have four computers, your work will not be four times faster. It might, uh, it will be definitely uh, a factor of four, but slightly more. Yeah. And the program also has to be written to use these multiple things. So. 
as a good point, just yeah. by offering a number of processor or cores doesn't mean that every program will use them. No. When you say core, what do you mean? Then I meant this processor inside a processor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I mean, so... today, uh, in, if I would open up the laptop, I would probably see something that looks like one chip. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know, 10 years ago maybe, or longer, 20 years ago, I don't know. So mm -hmm. this chip was actually one processor, but now if I would open up the chip and look at it through a, yeah. through a microscope, then oh, I would see that there are actually yeah. a couple of processors hidden on the chip. Yeah. So I guess core is like the fundamental unit of computing. And yeah. So there's different ways of doing this. So you can create, you can have one program that can use multiple cores at once, a multi-threading idea. You can split your program so it basically runs multiple programs somewhat independently, and they're using different processors that way. There's things like message passing interface or MPI, which, um, which is what, a way of communicating between different processes. So for example, this is often used for the biggest programs that run on clusters and use hundreds or thousands or even more cores at once to do some mega simulation. And in the end, many of these are uh, managed via a batch system on the cluster. So once you have this cluster with thousands of processors, you don't just connect to it and run something yourself, but you, um, you have to request the resources and then you get all these processors and memory for a certain amount of time. And then you run the program and then it, well, returns the answer and you look and you can repeat. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, so on my laptop here, on the work laptop, I can see that there are eight cores, supposedly. So how can I make use of those? And that's, that's even before going on a cluster and before, yeah. how, what can I do? Yeah. So is the program you're using written by you or written by someone else? Let's imagine it's written by somebody else. Yeah. So, it's, so let's imagine it's, um, it's an R or Python or mm -hmm. MATLAB, um, some yeah. data analysis. Yeah. Something, um, so I'm reading, reading a file and then it does a lot of uh, yeah. filtering and statistics and at the end it produces some yeah. plot. Well, so either it has the ability to use multiple cores built in or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it's up to you to run the program multiple times. So for example, you could make a script that will run it eight different times on eight different pieces of input data. How do I find out whether it can use all the cores or not? How do you check? <laughs> well, isn't that an interesting question? So oftentimes people come to us and ask, oh, I want to use this on our cluster. How do I do it? And we would say, okay, first let's look at the documentation to see. And then it turns out that, like, it doesn't really say, it just promises to be able to, but doesn't, well, doesn't say. So what I'm saying here is this can actually be harder than you imagine. Ideally, the program would say how to do it and how to control it. I can show maybe one way, a sort of very pedestrian way mm -hmm. that I use, let yeah. me show that. Share that quick. Okay. And you got it's a um, it's a top mm. top mm. command. Uh, in, in actually, it's H top. It doesn't matter what top command. Which in my case shows that well, there are eight cores and they do something. Um, and what I would do is I would start this computation, and then have a look at this. And if I see that well, one processor is really busy and all the other processes mm. do nothing, then gives me a hint that this is really not using them. Yeah. So I guess those are the eight processors at the top of the screen numbered from zero to seven. Yes. Yeah. And we can see they're all like 20% used right now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Actually, mostly with, the, with this video call. Yeah. 
And that's often what happens on our cluster too. Like someone runs something and we just connect to it and then run htop and see what's it actually doing. Yeah, so I will stop sharing here. Yeah. So what do we need to know about networks? There's actually something interesting here. I think it was called Schmidt's Law. Mm. No. Well, it was someone, I think, from one of the former CEOs of Google that said something like he he'd made up some law or hypothesis, whatever it's called, that as the network becomes faster, the network becomes the computer. So basically, like from the Google point of view, so when our internet is so fast, basically Google Drive, Gmail, all these things are an extension of our own computer to the point where using just our computer is not really enough to get our work done. We need everything on the network to do it. And I think this has really transformed the way research can be done. So you are referring to basically data being stored somewhere else and working with it, uh, say for example, on my computer while the data is physically located somewhere else mm -hmm. and using internet in this case. Uh, no. do you, would you have an example of that? Yeah. Or how would you do that in uh, in a cluster computer. Yeah. So maybe this isn't exactly what most people do in a cluster computer, but let's say data is stored somewhere else, like on the cluster. And I want to look at the images that are stored there. Like I made some plots or something and I want to see them. So one thing I could do is I could copy the data to my computer. But the other idea is to do what we call mounting a network file system. So there's different ways to do this, like SSHFS is one, or there's the SMB protocol, which can mount something over the network. And it basically makes the files on the other computer appear as if they're files on your computer. And anytime you access them, it um, is actually accessing them from the other side. And this is great because it saves you from having to copy things back and forth all the time. And then, um, Yeah, and then makes everything available, just like locally. So you can use all your own normal programs to view things, even if the other computer doesn't have graphical applications or so on. And to me, this is really sort of completely transformed work. So no longer there's one computer, but there might be the storage server. For example, our clusters storage. And this is available on every node of the cluster. It's available on our workstations at work. Using SSHFS, I can make it available on my home computer. So there's one place for files to be where all my projects go, and I can access it from anywhere and use any resources which, are, which can see that data. And this is really transformative, if you ask me. But then at the end of the project, uh... What should I do with the data? Should I just leave it there? Should I? What, do I need to do something with it? I guess. Uh, and what I'm hinting at is that uh, it's it's nice to have all these services and the cloud services, but mm -hmm. I mean they come and go. And when they when you get like a notice that in two months they will discontinue and <laughs> you need to then or or is this simply switched off? Yeah, that's a good question. So. I guess one starting point is you should, mm, well, the first step is you need to be sure to think about these things. So you have to think, what do I want to do with the data? It might be that you save some of it and delete some of it. It might be you want to save everything. And then there's the question, how do you save it? So do you save it? Well, 
like Radovan said, almost every service goes away eventually. And keeping something available for 10 years or even going for like 100 years is a really difficult question. And personally, what I would say is if you want something to be available in 100 years, then you need to make it open. So basically put it on something where other people can see it and access it. So if we're a scientist, there's all these scientific data repositories, like say Zenodo or something like that. And if you open it and put it there, then you're basically guaranteed to be able to find it later. Other than that, well, you just have to see what services are available and put it there and realize every service is going to go down eventually, except for something that's a permanent archive with someone else maintaining it. So, uh, so in this case, uh, I should also care about the format of the file, mm -hmm. I, I believe. Yeah. So storing it, as you mentioned previously, storing it as a, a Microsoft Word file might not be the best idea. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would your suggestions be other than CSV uh, when it comes to storing data? Mm -hmm. uh, like it, Of course, it depends quite a lot on types of data that you're trying to yeah. store. But generally speaking, what are some good scientific, uh, you know, formats that are used mm. in the scientific world that might be open as well and would be accessible, hopefully, in yeah. uh, at least 50 years, if not 100? Hmm. Now you're asking the hard questions. Can I deflect the question and say you should search for archival file formats and then look at those that analysis and see? Um, hmm. Also, uh, take a format which is because it depends on the academic uh, discipline. So different disciplines have different formats. So something standard, but there is not one standard. It really depends on the on the domain. Yeah. Um, if possible, version it because mm -hmm. also formats evolve. Mm -hmm. uh, open format better than proprietary format. And I think that even in as Microsoft Word. I mean, I, I think it will be readable 50 years from now because there is simply so many trillions of documents that mm -hmm. somebody will make sure that we can at least convert it to something else. Yeah. But version, version of metadata is important there. Yeah. So if I share the screen here, we see I search for archival file formats. And the second link is archival format from National Archives. And third link is table of file formats from National Archives. And this can probably give you an idea on what someone has recommended as, um, well, what they think will be available in a hundred years. For example, digital audio. We see two preferred formats and some acceptable formats. So, yeah. Hmm. Is there anything else we, about... Oh, uh, yeah, I ahead. wanted to add that when we talk about 100 years and available to other people, I always like to motivate that it's really good if it's readable in five years by the same research group. <laughs> yeah. And that's already really good. So it's, it's nice, it's very good to think about the community and other people, but already just for myself and for the research group, it would be nice to have a data management plan and document these things so that they are reusable by the next person who comes. Yeah. Like, yeah, like we've, we've, I've said a hundred years so many times, but really the number of research groups that can't find and use things from five years ago is huge. And if you can just solve that problem, then you're already doing pretty well. Should we go on to some later topic. Hmm, we have five minutes and there's still so much we haven't said yet. Yeah, we can maybe do 10 minutes, but yeah. So there are a couple of topics. Some of them, I mean, we can move to, you know, future, future episode. Yeah. I mean, so there's memory, we can talk about operating systems, software, programming, uh, debugging. Yeah. What about operating systems and interfaces? So how would you compare the three main 
systems, Windows, Linux, and Mac, and then also graphical versus command line interface. When would you use each of these? So, uh, I I was uh, I have used Windows quite a lot growing up, uh, but at work I used to use Linux. Uh, but with the work from home setting in, I had to use uh, oh, I had to switch back to Windows because laptop and considerations. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what I found eventually over last two years approximately is that Windows ecosystem has grown quite a bit in terms of supporting uh, uh, what essentially is Linux commands and Linux interface. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, uh, when it comes to scientific data analysis, uh, I'm very comfortable with using Windows, uh, even though it was not never my first choice for that purpose. Uh, I, I believe the reason is that the ecosystem has grown quite a bit and the support mm -hmm. uh, has really increased. Uh, on the other hand, I've always heard good things about Mac being able to handle both of them because it's based on BSD, which allows it to be uh, multifunctional, uh, giving the best of GUI and as well as, uh, uh, yeah, basically command line interface. Uh, but I believe also that all uh, almost everyone in the research of engineering field would be somewhat biased towards linux because of the uh, because of it being open simply yeah. as simple as that i've heard a lot of the same like it was what 10 or 15 years ago that many people started moving to mac because it was unix under the hood and had the command line interface and the ease of use of graphical applications. And now the same for Windows. So they've, they're, they have this thing, what Windows services for Linux, which gives you the command line power. And with that, well, you know, that's what you need. So then what's I have the... a couple of, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just want to say that I have a couple of uh, colleagues who used to be really diehard Linux um, developers and but as they moved up into management positions, they have also moved into Windows. Mm -hmm. And I think now they are really, really similar to the systems. Yeah. So why, what's the point of the command line interface if we say it's so important? Yeah, why I think it's we... very important. Um, and for me, the main reason is because you can, it's easier to automate. You can automate it, you can script it, also you can interact with a command line interface, you can interact with the program from other programs. So you can you can actually put programs together. You can create workflows. Yeah, that that is a lot easier. I know there's an actual. This means something else that's not this, but it's almost like meta programming. Like you write programs to control other programs, and then you can get a lot more done. So I guess the real term is scripting. So. If a program has a scripting interface and you know how to use it, then you can really do a lot. Hmm. Does anyone feel that this is a barrier when it comes to doing stuff on the phone or is it just me? On the phone, you mean like? Uh, like something as simple as mass renaming a file mm. would is almost impossible on a phone unless yeah. I download a special piece of software granted a zillion permissions and uh, do it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, like when you don't have this interface, you rely on other people to make programs to do what you need. And yeah, I feel pretty limited by that too. So, yeah. Mm. What are certain times when you have felt that having the graphical user interface is beneficial or you would have preferred to use a graphical user interface? Hmm. So I think the main benefit there is it presents things in an easy to understand way. 
So instead of looking for options and commands, you can easily click on every menu and read every possible action and then study things that way. And yeah, like basically it sort of teaches you how to use it at the same time you're using it. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. And how about user shanks as well? I'm thinking about some good example where. So for me, this was when I was using uh, uh, LaTeX, and mm. since uh, like th this is uh, all the input that you generally would have in LaTeX is text, but what you really want out of it is something graphic because you are laying out a document and you want your text to go in a certain direction and your images to go into a certain uh, place on the page. And this is where I have felt uh, very limited by using a text interface because, uh, yeah, with mm -hmm. mo uh, the more you try to format it and look at, uh, make it look a certain manner, the more text commands you give and then the chances that they counter each other or do not fit well with each other mm -hmm. increases uh, drastically. So. Uh, this is one place where I found uh, that unless really required, I would still go to a word, standard word processor. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the sake of uh, productivity, stick with it rather than uh, yeah wrangle my way through a LaTeX editor. I'm no LaTeX expert. And there was a time, I believe, there was uh, utility in trying to learn LaTeX properly and doing everything, uh, but with modern word processors, that has reduced quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Same things like spreadsheets or something like that, like. Yeah. With the spreadsheets, I think it still makes a bit more sense uh, to use tech, uh, you know, command line or mm -hmm. some um, some kind of programming language if the data is mm -hmm. uh, too much. Uh, because again, uh, you are tending to do repetitive actions, mm -hmm. which are best done with command line, but with text particularly. Uh, I ended up using something called uh, licks or looks, depending on how mm -hmm. uh, on where you are. And this is this was very helpful for me. I can paste a link in the uh, chat, mm -hmm. which is it's basically a graphical user interface built around LaTeX. Yeah. Hmm. What do we need to know when we're learning how to do programming? To switch to a new topic. Any important topics there? Or maybe we should be wrapping up by now. I think it's such a big topic that maybe we can move it to a different episode. Yeah. We did it just race through it. Um, yeah, maybe we've covered most of the essential things except for programming. What about the last thing? How about we cover how we learn new things? What about that? So when you're starting off and there's this huge amount of stuff we need to be able to do, like how do you how do you learn new stuff? Do we learn everything in courses? Do we learn by reading books? How did you learn stuff? Yeah, reading books. So I also like to learn things by trying them out on something that like on a real problem, or mm -hmm. a small problem, but let's say I want to try a new programming language. Yeah. So then I try to test it out on some on a problem that I need to solve. Mm -hmm. Of course, it makes it a bit harder. So I spend more time on it than if I would on the maybe on the program language with the programming language that I know. But if I have a little bit of time, and I manage to do it, then then I manage to do two things in one go. I mean, I solve the problem, hopefully, but also once something new. Yeah. And, and then it's probably not Maybe I didn't do that in a very nice way, and that there is and there is a ton to improve. But it's how I learn mm -hmm. try like new tools or new languages. 
is this like hobby problems or something like that. So you do something for fun using a new tool or new something. Could be a hobby problem, could be like a small, should, could be a small work problem, but mm -hmm. something small manageable. Yeah. Once I heard someone say something like, if you're trying to learn something new, just do something. The worst case, you break it, and then you can figure out how to fix it, and then you've learned two things. Would you agree with this idea? Uh, I would say that is how I've learned everything so far. <laughs> My breaking stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I'm really, I guess, most things that could do something really bad, like uh, lose your data, are usually pretty clear. Like the risk of losing all your data, all data on your computer is not that high. Or at least it's it cl clear when you're doing something that that's that is that risky. And if it happens, then it was a very good lesson, which you will probably not forget <laughs> for the rest of your life. So yeah, good learning right there. Yeah, learning through mistakes. Great point. I mean, I've done every possible mistake. I think. Yeah. And will continue to, to do so. And also, I think I've learned so much by simply being around other people that do more advanced things than me. Like, uh, whenever I started exploring Linux, it's not like I did everything myself, but I had a friend that sort of like got me started and said, okay, do this and this. And then I'd be constantly asking questions about what do I do such and such until they sort of stopped answering the questions. And I realized that was because I was at the point where I had to figure out stuff myself. But you know, this idea of having the person at the desk next to you or the friend that you see occasionally and can talk to, I think that's one of the most important ways of learning things. And in fact, that's why we're here in Research Software Hour because I think that just hearing people talk about things gets you started on a good path. One of my friends uh, had a similar strategy where they would get me excited about some particular topic. Mm -hmm. And then at a cliffhanger, they would tell me, go read about it, <laughs> <laughs> which, which was uh, annoying, but very, uh, very productive. Mm -hmm. So they want to get you interested so you would learn about it and teach them? Or uh, yeah, because they 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 had these interests and they would like uh, you know someone to share it with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I was a nice guinea pig who was willing to learn, and I learned quite a lot. Nice, yeah. I think I never learned as much as during my PhD when I was not doing what I was supposed to be doing. So. Does anyone else feel the same way? Uh, I, I, I do. I, I believe you learn quite a lot in unstructured time, I mm -hmm. would say. Like uh, when you're not supposed to, uh, like sometimes because you're, pro you're trying to procrastinate mm -hmm. on what really needs to be done, maybe. Uh, yeah. And sometimes because uh, you are quite interested about something maybe it's not so necessary for the project you are working mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. but it's spiked your interest so that's yeah. that's uh, always very productive learning sessions yeah well with that being said should we say please give suggestions on other things you would like to learn and we can prepare them and talk about them Yes, and let's talk about some of the topics that we left out some other time, like programming, debugging, software. Yeah. There's so much to say, but mm -hmm. that will be for another episode. Should we add a session later this year on debugging? Like, say, programming and debugging. Yeah. Also, yeah. adding a, you know integration development environments mm -hmm. somewhere in between that, mm -hmm. because yeah. Okay, yeah, this could go with our IDE one. Okay, well, we have an idea for a future topic, so, yeah. 
Okay, well, anything else or should we start wrapping up? Yeah, well, I don't hear many other ideas, so should we begin going? Sounds good. I mean, we could talk for hours, but yeah. let's, continue some, let's continue some other time. Yeah. Thanks so much for watching, for listening. Okay, well, great. Thanks so much to Shashank and to Richard, and looking forward to more in two weeks. Yeah. Okay, see you all later. Bye. Bye, thanks. Thanks a lot.